Good afternoon everybody and welcome to our worship this afternoon. You'll notice that I said this afternoon and not this morning because unfortunately we had big technical problems this morning and we're having to record the service this afternoon and then it will be transferred to YouTube. Presumably we must have been successful in doing that otherwise you wouldn't be hearing my words now. And a huge thank you to the technical people who put all this together, not least because they do a good job all of the time, but the issues that we had this morning, they must be feeling very frustrated. Next Sunday's service will be led by our minister, Tim Sowell, and will be on the website and YouTube, we hope, rather than on Zoom, as we were trying to do. And of course, there will be the coffee Zoom after the service next week. And you will receive an email telling you how to access that. So let's begin our worship just with a, a few moments of silence. And then we'll hear our call to worship. I'll continue. We've gathered today in many separate places to worship because Jesus invites us to come. We have gathered today in many separate places with our faith and our doubts, with our successes and our failures, because Jesus invites us to come. We come with what we have, bringing with us the events and experiences of this past week. Because Jesus invites us to come. And so as we gather together, loving God, open our eyes to the beauty of your holiness. Open our ears to the message of your word. Open our minds to the challenge of your truth. Open our hearts to the power of your love. Open our minds to the coming of your spirit. Let us worship together. Amen. And we sing now together from Singing the Faith, number 403. God is love, his the care.
So we come now to a time of prayer. Please join in any of the words in the prayers, but particularly, please join us in the words in the bold title. In these strange times, it's good to feel your presence here with us. To be awakened from refreshing sleep and begin another day. To feel the wonder of the changing seasons, the warmth of the sun, the sudden cooling breeze, the refreshing rain is to know the love of you, our Creator, our Parent God, all around us. God is good. We praise Him. To be surrounded by the love and trust of friends, to feel the love of our church fellowship in these times of separation, via the telephone or internet, to hear a reassuring word, to see an encouraging smile. All this is to know your love, love among us. God is good. We praise him. To experience the presence of God as we worship together now, is to know your Holy Spirit alive in our midst. Your Holy Spirit is here with us wherever we are. We are separate in our own homes and yet we are all here together. God is good. We praise him. Because of our daily experience of you, our God, we are moved to say over and over again, yes, God is good. We praise him. Amen. And a prayer now asking for God's forgiveness. And this will contain times of silence in which we can each add our own thoughts. God of grace, forgive our self-concern. Forgive our lack of love. Forgive our ill-judged thoughts. God of mercy, forgive our impatience. Forgive our hard hearts. Forgive our harsh words. God of peace. Forgive our need for conflict. Forgive our wounding pride. Forgive our careless actions. Lord, in your mercy, Hear these our prayers, spoken and unspoken. Amen. In this service we're studying, or in this month rather, of uh, Bible month, we're studying the book of Ruth. And this week we're looking at chapter 2. And we're now going to hear the first part of that chapter read by Jane, 
we'll hear the second part of it a little later. So I'm reading from Ruth chapter 2 verses 1 to 16. Now Naomi had a kinsman on her husband's side, a prominent rich man of the family of Elimelech, whose name was Boaz. And Ruth the Moabite said to Naomi, let me go to the field and glean among the ears of grain behind someone in whose sight I may find favour. She said to her, go my daughter. So she went. She came and gleaned in the field behind the reapers. As it happened, she came to the part of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Just then, Boaz came from Bethlehem. He said to the reapers, the Lord be with you. They answered, the Lord bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was in charge of the reapers, To whom does this young woman belong? The servant, who was in charge of the reapers, answered, She is the Moabite who came back with Naomi from the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather among the sheaves behind the reapers. So she came and she has been on her feet from early this morning until now, without resting even for a moment. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go to glean in another field, or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped, and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. Then she fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favour in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, all that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds, and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. Then she said, May I continue to find favour in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat some of this bread and dip your morsel in the sour wine. So she sat beside the reapers, and he heaped up for her some parched grain. She ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. When she got up to glean, Boaz instructed his young men, Let her glean even among the standing sheaves, and do not reproach her. You must also pull out some handfuls for her, from the bundles and leave them for her to glean and do not rebuke her. Thank you very much, Jane. Just a short prayer now. Lord, may my words now and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our strength our Redeemer. Amen. So as I said earlier, today we look at the second chapter of Ruth. And maybe we ought to just have a very quick catch up on chapter one. You remember that Naomi has left Judah with her family to find a better life in the land of the Moabites. 
and of course it's not gone well for her. Her husband and her two married sons have both died, leaving her a widow with two widowed daughter-in-law. Eventually, Naomi decides to return to Judea, where there are now reports of a good harvest and better prospects for herself. She suggests her daughters return to their families in Moab. One of her daughters-in-law, Orpha, decides to stay in Moab, but Ruth decides to commit her future to being with Naomi and travelling back to Judea. And she will put her trust now in a new God. And they arrive in Bethlehem at harvest time. Naomi, of course, is coming home, but Ruth is travelling to a new country and now finds herself a complete outsider. Except, of course, for being Naomi's daughter-in-law. So we've heard the continuing story now and the first part of chapter two read to us. So what does it all mean for us? Can we see parallels in the world of today? Well, as we go along, I think you can. I think you can see a lot of parallels. Maybe so many parallels that we really need more time to think about them. Despite having been given a welcome, Ruth and Naomi are very much alone. We're not told that anyone has brought them food or even offered them shelter. And the first thing I wondered is if they had been locals, if they hadn't been strangers, would they have been offered food and shelter more easily, more sooner? Does how we care depend on the people that we're caring for rather than their actual need as human beings? How do Naomi and Ruth set about finding food? The story tells us that there is a relative of Naomi's husband living in Jerusalem. His name is Boaz and he's seen as a respected man of influence in the society and judging by the things he says he's a man of God. Ruth decides to go out to work in the fields to gather the leftover grain and finds herself working in a field belonging to this Boaz. This process of gathering grain is called gleaning. It's the act of collecting leftover crops from farmers' fields that have been commercially harvested or on fields where it's not economically profitable to harvest. And it's a practice that became a legally enforced entitlement of the poor in very many kingdoms. And we sometimes find similar arrangements today. My own brother-in-law and his wife used to do this every year in Pembrokeshire after the potato harvest. Now today, of course, feeding and helping those in desperate need, not people like my brother-in-law, but people in desperate need, is more often dealt with in quite different ways. We have food banks, the basics bank, which we support through the church. And as I wrote these words, I thought, are we still supporting the Basics Bank when we're not actually there? Social Services does a lot of work. Charities, large and small, even celebrities are setting up food delivery projects. And then you've got all the tax arrangements, the universal credit and other complex government schemes furloughing in the present circumstances. How, I wonder, do we see the notion of gleaning today? The idea that it was a legally enforceable entitlement to be provided with the means to gather food. Should it perhaps now be more about love in the Christian sense of that word? 
not so much that it's a legal right for those who need food to be fed, but more that it's quite simply totally unacceptable if they're not. We as Christians must play our part in all of this, and surely this need to care goes way beyond food. But back to Ruth in her field. Boaz himself has now arrived from the city. And as I said, clearly a religious man, judging by the things that he says, he greets those working for him with the words, the Lord be with you. He finds Ruth, a stranger, working in his fields and asks who she is. Who does she belong to? She learns he's a Moabite. He, he rather learns that she is a Moabite. And of course, he discovers that she's distantly related to him. She asks for and gets permission from Boaz to continue her gleaning and is keen to see that she gathers where the women are working and not to go where the men are. And he assures her that they will not lay a hand on her and she can get a drink from their water jars. Now, I don't want to make too much of this point, but it did occur to me that the problems that women face in the workplace, it seems are nothing new. Certainly in my time of working, I could think of quite a few incidents of women suffering because they were women. And when I worked at Keystone recently, there was, most of the residents were indeed men, but there was one young lady, and a very attractive young lady she was. And one day when I was visiting her house, I found her sitting at the foot of the stairs crying. And I said, what's the matter? And to cut a long story short, she simply said to me, Tom, I wish I was ugly so that men would leave me alone. And I thought, wow, maybe that's not what this passage is about, but that's, that came to my mind. Ruth is eternally grateful to Boaz for the opportunities that he's given her. Why have I found such favour in your eye that you notice me, a foreigner, she says. And Boaz confirms that he's been told about what happened in Moab and that Ruth, what Ruth has done and is doing for her mother-in-law. This is surely God's love seen in Boaz's acts of compassion. And we can do the same for those that we find in need. There seems to be a huge emphasis in this chapter on Ruth being a foreigner, somebody from another place. How do we treat foreigners today? This is very relevant to us at the moment. There's even a shortage of the usual groups of migrant workers who come to help in the harvest of our own crops even a shortage of Australian sheep shearers, it seems. But how do we treat foreigners in all areas of our life? Are they made welcome? Does it matter to us where they come from? On a slightly trivial name, what way I was born in Wales, but well, that's got no relevance at all to my life in Winchester. But for many, many people today, the place of their birth is of huge significance. Worse still, their so-called colour is of importance. Most assuredly, black lives matter, but surely all lives matter. 
How does it feel to be a foreigner, a stranger in a foreign land? I think we forget sometimes that it can be very scary indeed. I remember when I was working in Africa on a particular Sunday, I decided to venture to the local church, which turned out to be absolutely huge congregation of at least 500 people, 499 locals, and Tom, as white, stood out like a sore thumb, and I felt very strange. And I have to say that they were absolutely wonderful and made me feel really, really welcome. I guess it was obvious to them that I was a stranger because I was white. And I remember somebody shouting out, hey, whitey. But what does this all have to say for how we treat strangers in our church fellowship even? Have we regulars forgotten how scary it can be to walk into a strange church on a Sunday morning? <laughs> I think one bonus we're finding from our streamed worship at the moment is that it has enabled the church to stop hiding behind its walls and be seen to be more active, more accessible to outsiders, strangers, foreigners, if you like via social media folk can enter into our activities without feeling so vulnerable. I wonder if there are any people doing that now, thinking I'll listen to what the United Church is up to and see what they have to say. If that is the case, I do hope they contact us. Wouldn't it be wonderful to know who they were? But even technology is not that clever. But back to Ruth and our story. She is now welcomed into the fellowship of the harvesters, eats with them. She is given barley, which the men themselves have reaped. It seems that now she has been accepted. No longer a stranger. Can we hear the rest of the chapter now, Jane? Apologies. So continuing from verse 17. So she gleaned in the field until evening. Then she beat out what she had gleaned, and it was about an effort of barley. She picked it up and came into the town, and her mother-in-law saw how much she had gleaned. Then she took out and gave her what was left over after she herself had been satisfied. Her mother-in-law said to her, Where did you glean today, and where have you worked? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. So she told her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The name of the man with whom I work today is Boaz. Then Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he by the Lord, whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead. Naomi also said to her, the man is a relative of ours, one of our nearest kin. Then Ruth the Moabite said, He even said to me, Stay close by my servants until they have finished all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is better, my daughter, that you go out with his young women, otherwise you might be bothered in another field. So she stayed close to the young women of Boaz, gleaning until the end of the barley and wheat harvests, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Thank you very much indeed, Jane. 
So we're told that Ruth has worked all day in the fields and has even been involved in the threshing. And she takes away an ephah of barley. I'm sure you all know what an ephah is, because I certainly didn't. It's about 40 litres. That's a big load for one lady to glean, let alone carry. And there's enough to feed both Ruth and Naomi for today and longer. Ruth tells Naomi what she's been doing, who she's been working with, and that Boaz has agreed to let her carry on working and gleaning until the harvest is complete. Their future, at least in the short term, seems to be secure. And his generosity has surprised Ruth and Naomi all the more because she is a Moabite, a foreigner. Naomi must have found somewhere to live now because, as we heard, the chapter ends with the words, and Ruth lived with her mother-in-law. I'd like to go back and pick out a few more points, but obviously we don't have time this afternoon. So where do we find God in all this? Are we meant to see Boaz as God? I don't think so. Are we to understand that God is able to work through Boaz? Yes, I think we are. Surely it's about what can be achieved when we all work together with God for each other, foreigners, locals, young and old, men and women. As so often in the stories we find in our Bibles, it's really about love, about God's love. God's love can be seen and worked through our lives too, if only we will allow it to flow through us. It's especially clear in this time of lockdown how much we all need each other. So why do we care for each other? Because we need each other. We need fellowship, one with another, and above all with God, our creator. We are built for fellowship. Ruth and Naomi needed answers to their questions about where to live, how to find food, and of course, so much more. They wanted fellowship, peace, and security. And at this time of concern for our treatment of our brothers of a different race or colour, that's exactly what we need too. They wanted to know what their future together would bring. And at this time of an uncertain outcome of the pandemic, that's precisely what we want too. They wanted their suffering and their grief to be taken away. And so do the huge number of refugees, needy people in our world today. I think the story of Ruth reminds us that God already knows about our needs and our wants. And if we would only listen to his word and act upon it, we can create a better future. And the power, the love of God, the spirit of God enabling us to satisfy our needs and to create that better world for all people is right here in all of us, all of the time. Amen.
just a few moments of quiet and then Joe will lead us in our intercessions and then lead us through the Lord's Prayer. Joe. Let us bring our prayers for the world and ourselves. Dear Lord, as we and the rest of the world struggle with the global coronavirus pandemic, the news that we hear brings many things to concern us, but also some sparks of hope that we pray would be fanned into flames of positive change. We bring just a few of these to you in prayer this morning. It has become clear that the necessity of lockdown has resulted in an increase in domestic abuse as well as increased activity by online sexual predators. And we pray for those who are caught up in these appalling situations that they may be given the strength and the opportunity to break free. There are so many whose incomes have diminished while the demand on their limited resources has increased. Feed those for whom going hungry is a very real and often regular prospect. We pray for the continued resourcing of food banks and schemes working hard to provide meals to children not currently being fed in schools. Thank you for the energy and commitment of volunteers whose work is needed more than ever. May those of us who have more than sufficient do what we can to support those who have less than is sufficient. In some of the world's poorest countries, those living in poverty and those who have been displaced are at even greater risk as the virus spreads. And we pray for the work of all organizations such as Christian Aid, and UNHCR as they use their experience and expertise to inform and support vulnerable communities in an attempt to minimize the effect of the pandemic. While it is impossible to find positivity in any form of racial discrimination, we do pray, Lord, that the sparks of protest that are growing through our nation and others will finally be a catalyst for real change in understanding, in attitudes, and in institutions. On a personal level, help each of us to engage with the questions and inequalities being highlighted by the Black Lives Matter movement, that we may, with the guidance of your Holy Spirit, gain a deeper understanding and empathy. We will have a few moments of quiet now as we focus on our prayer bowl, a symbol of those prayers that are on our hearts. For those in distress, those in pain, those grieving, those struggling with difficult decisions, and those fearing an unpredictable future. Loving God, accept these our prayers. Amen. Amen. I invite you to join with me in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Joe.
Our closing hymn is 693 from Song Singing the Faith. Beauty for brokenness, hope for despair. So wherever you are, go now in peace. If your path is long, praise God, for he will walk with you. If your path is tough, praise God, for he will be there with you. If your path is easy, 
especially remember to praise God, for he will always be with you. Amen. And let's just close by saying the grace to each other. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.